the cat, it comes out of the, the hypothalamus, triggered by the amygdala. The hypothalamus produces everything you need to survive while being attacked on the savanna by some jungle, by some cat or something, some, some lion. You will then get ready, your whole body will be ready to fight or for run, run or fight for your life. Although these kids are doing it for nothing, they're because they didn't have you know, pancakes. <laughs> it's ridiculous why they should, but their body is going into as if they're in the savannah and a lion is gonna kill them. And so you get the rage reaction, the, the display of weapons, the teeth, the eyes, because we don't have ears that can go back, but if we did, they'd go back. <laughs> because that's part of the thing. We don't have a tail, so we don't have that. But we have all the things inside the body that are changing to make them stronger. The blood vessels in the hands and feet constrict so that they don't bleed as much if they get bitten. The blood vessels in the head can uh, dilate, so there's more blood going to flow through to the brain. And the heart pumps faster, and they breathe faster, and there's so many things going on. There's adrenaline flooding the body, and they become extremely strong. And there's no thinking. The Incredible Hulk comes out of the kid, is what happens. Or, in this case, the cat. <laughs> no thinking, just pure, I'm going to get it, rage. Very different than the quiet, premeditated aggression from a mad kid. See the mad face? Very different face. This kid wants to hurt you. This one wants to eat you. And they're going to quietly do it. <laughs> they're going to find a way to eat you quietly. If you make a lot of noise, you're going to run away. They're very quiet. They're very quiet, and he's going to be very quietly hiding behind the door, and he's going to get you when you pass. He's going to, he's going to plan it. He's going to do it in a, in a controlled, a very effective way, and he's going to hurt you. Mean type, angry, mm, premeditated. Very different, very different than this face. This is closer to the junkyard dog. The junk display of teeth, watch the feet, look, look at the, the muscles, look at the eyes, crazy eyes. Arr. That dog doesn't want to hurt you. He wants you to get away from the fence. <laughs> this is my territory. Get away from the fence or I'll bite you. You come closer, you will get bitten, I guarantee it. Touch that dog, you will be bitten. Absolutely. Touch this kid and he will assault you. He will try to kill you, literally. This is defensive. If you back away, he stops growling and stops snarling. If you back away from this, this kid, the same thing. It, it winds it down. That's all it takes. You don't have to say a word. In fact, if you talk, you talk to the dog, you think he's going to calm him down? No. Talk to the kid, he's not going to calm him down. It winds him up. So this is defensive, hot, noisy, rage. Very different. This is cold. This is Brooklyn. <clears throat> He didn't want to eat me, but he wants, to, he wants my wallet. He wants something. For, he wants to win in some way. This one wants to eat. The, what he's, he's not mad at the, he's not mad at the wildebeest. He has, he's, there's no emotion. There's no emotion. He, has, he, may, he may be a little happy, but he's not emotional. He has no anger at the wildebeest. He's just hungry. He wants to eat that wildebeest. So this is no emotion. There's no emotion here. I'm just going to hurt you. Or give me your wallet or I'll hurt you. You know, it's, it's a, it's a there's no, it's not emotional. Cold, unemotional, as opposed to my kids. Crazy face, crazy eyes, jaw clenching. Classic cute, but classic anger face. She wants to hurt you. She would love to hurt you. She's just trying to figure out the best, best way to do it. Is it going to be on the Facebook or is it going to be by, you know, <laughs> kicking you? Or she, she's going she to find the best way to hurt you because she is angry and wants to hurt you. And that's the thing, she wants to hurt you. She's, it's offensive, offensive anger, offensive aggression. You can see it in the face. She's not gonna tell you she's gonna do it, she's gonna wait when you're not, when you're not looking. <laughs> and she's, not gonna, she, she's gonna do it in a way that's gonna probably save herself from getting uh, punished or hurt. Very, very cautious. Not my kids, they're not cautious. If, if, the, if the cops come with batons, they attack them. You know, it doesn't make any sense. They're not cautious, they're just responding. The amygdala is responding. This is my kid. Rage face, classic, classic rage face. Jaw clenching, they cannot not do it. They can't stop. If it's the amygdala doing it, the amygdala makes the jaw clench. It flares the nostrils, it dilates the pupils, tightens the muscles. It's classic. When you see that face, you know the amygdala is in charge. There's nobody home. There's nobody to talk to. There's no relationship between you and this person. I don't care if this person loves you. <laughs> this person is not there. You're talking to the amygdala. The amygdala doesn't love you. It wants to kill you. 
But the only reason he wants to kill you is because you're a threat. If you were not a threat, then that's fine. He just, it's defensive. So if you can make yourself less of a threat, you see that face? Stop talking. Stop de-escalating, the usual verbal de-escalation. Stop walking closer. Don't put your arm around this kid, please. What, what? We had this girl. I don't know why girls have combs that come to a point, but they all come to a point. Anyway, this, she showed this face. The, the sweetie therapist said, what, what's the matter, dear? And she stabbed the therapist with this comb. With this. What does that do for you, that comb? Oh, never mind. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Ah, what happened? Anyway, so there's a, there's a different kind of crisis management, different kind of medication, different kind of discipline. You cannot punish away irritability. Picture a kid who comes in because he's sick, and he's six years old, and he's sick, and he's grouchy, and he kicks the dog. If you punish him, are you going to stop him from being grouchy? The kid is sick. You can't stop it with punishment. You can't punish away irritability, and I try to explain this to the families. In fact, parent training in positive discipline is so much better than what they've been trying to do, which is the usual and customary, spare the rod, spoil the child, and fix it. They try to punish away the misbehaviors. And these are not misbehaviors. This is just a manifestation of irritability. It's a mood. You can't punish away a mood. It makes it worse. So we need positive discipline. Uh, it's amazing how, what a difference there is if the kid is running and you say, stop running, or else, <laughs> and then you punish him for running, that's typical discipline. <laughs> for in, our, in our program, we never do that. We never say stop, simply because they can't. We assume they're incapable of stopping, that they are incompetent to stop, and there's no point in telling them to do something they can't do, and then threatening them, and then punishing them for doing what they, there's no point to that. We say, can you walk slowly? Oh, good job. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. I never say stop running. I just tell them what to do. I never tell them what to stop. They can do. There's nothing wrong with their steering and their accelerator. They're, I'm thinking the taxi cab, you know. The steering and accelerator fine. They can do anything I ask. They just can't stop. But if you use punitive discipline long enough, you're going to get an oppositional defiant kid. And if you have an ADHD kid on top of this, <laughs> Then you've got the ADHD medicines, which are going to irritate the amygdala. Not a good plan. Very common, by the way. ADHD is a very common comorbid condition. Oh, we're back. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. One more time, and then I'm no, no, I don't. Positive discipline. If you keep this, no, never mind. Okay. So, understand that it's it's very much like an emotional seizure. It's like having an emotional seizure, and the amygdala takes over, and it runs a course, just like epilepsy when they fall down and they shake. It's going to be a period of time they're going to shake, and then they're not going to stop shaking, and then they're going to be tired. And, and what's your job when the kid is having an epileptic seizure and shaking on the ground? What is your job? Just make sure they don't get hurt. Just keep it safe. That's the only, don't put anything in their mouth. The only thing you've got to do is keep it safe. That's your job. When this kid goes into this rage, you see rage face, don't try to move him out of the room. You've got to touch him. He'll assault you. That's ridiculous. Move everybody else out of the room. <laughs> Let him rant and rave and throw desks over, and it'll be over in a few minutes. But in the moment you try to deal with him, now ordinarily, if it's just anger face, you can move him out of the room and then talk to him in the hallway. That's great. But that's anger face. Rage face, don't touch him. Move everybody else out of the room. Keep them safe. You want to keep it safe. He'll assault anybody close to him. Anybody. It doesn't make any difference. Even somebody who wasn't in part of the problem. <laughs> Nothing. They were just standing there. You want to get him all away from him. You move him out of the room. And if he has a weapon, he's probably not going to hurt himself. But he's going to hurt anybody. So you, your job is to protect those that he might hurt. He's probably not going to do anything except looking at you as something that's dangerous to him. So if you make yourself less dangerous, the odds are he'll give up the weapon. Take five, ten minutes, and it's over. If you decide that you have to physically hold, which is not a good idea, especially when they get a little bit bigger, they just, they're strong. I mean, if you, it's hard enough to hold a six-year-old. Can you imagine holding a 16-year-old? They're very strong. Even the girls are very strong, extremely strong. <clears throat> so you don't ever, over, ever underestimate how strong they get. 
and how ferocious they get during this episode. So you gotta figure that the danger is you're gonna hurt them, break an arm, or, lay, or you're gonna asphyxiate them by sitting on their chest, and that happens a lot. People die, the kids die because they, they lay on their chest trying to hold, or they're gonna hurt you, and they can really hurt you. Head butts, very common, kicking, biting, scratching, all that. <laughs> so the idea is to not do that, not get involved in that episode, which is very dangerous. Back away, let them have their, let them have their emotional seizure. Now, if you think of it as an emotional seizure, by the way, we do use anti-seizure medication that seems to help these kids. But if you think of it as an emotional seizure, then there's no point to punish it afterwards, is there? You wouldn't punish epileptic fits. Well, don't punish this, it doesn't make any sense. They're out of control. They can't control it. It is completely out of their control. So this is no different than an epileptic fit other than it's emotional seizure. That's how we look at it. And for crisis management, Stop verbal de-escalation. Don't touch, don't walk toward them. Assume that they're looking at you as the threat and try to be less threatening. No show of force. Back away, back away slowly. See if you can back away toward, toward a door. So if they do, now what they're gonna do is threaten. Picture a gorilla in the jungle. They pound their, their, you know, they, they pound their chest, they throw a stuff, and then they run at you, but then they stop. They're making a threat to make you go away. They want you to go away. It isn't that they want to hurt you. They want you to go away. Now, if you don't go away, they'll hurt you. <laughs> so the idea is to slowly, don't make any fast moves. Fast moves will trigger an attack. Slowly back up. Don't talk. Look non-threatening. And, and don't, the idea is not to look like you're going to hurt them because that's, that's, they're acting as if you're the threat. And eventually they'll calm down, wind down, stop what they're doing. And that'll be the end of that episode. The episode goes away in five, 10 minutes. There's nothing to it. <clears throat> now, years ago, we used to use droperidol, which is we grab them, three, four people, we grab them, we give them an injection, they go to sleep. It was real fast, but it hurts their hearts, so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> Something about cardiac problems. But it's not a good idea to have a bunch of people having to jump on. You know, first of all, they're not always available. You're not going to have that in school. You know? So to be safe, best thing is clear the room. Don't try to touch them. Back away, let them have their, so if they break a chair, that's not, you know, better than breaking an arm or, you know, hurting you. So let them have their little emotional episode. And remember, the medication should be not just sedating, they should be treating something, targeted to treat a piece of brain. The therapies, I want positive discipline, I want to tra use training for the parents in how to discipline someone who's irritable all the time and you can't punish that away. And that training really helps, by the way. Uh, it does help a lot. There's good research to support that. Um, use your psychotherapies. I mean, you use play therapy or cognitive behavior therapy. All that is excellent. It helps a lot. But again, it's not, it's not enough by itself. It's necessary, but not sufficient by itself. Because when you get rid of the actual blowing up and there's no more episodes, you have still have, you've had years of this problem. You can imagine how disruptive the family is. I mean, they, these people are, are, are tiptoeing around. They're afraid of their siblings, everyone who knows this kid, their neighbors, they're all afraid of this kid. They're tiptoeing around. They're afraid, God, I'm, I'm gonna say the wrong thing, it'll blow up. They, the whole family is a mess. It takes some work to put that family together again. Um, and besides which, the kid, if this ain't got any brains, is gonna learn that um, people are afraid of him. Hmm, I can maybe use that. <laughs> and so it's possible to get some fake behaviors that are designed to win an argument. And so you now can get something completely different. You get that, by the way, in epilepsy too. In, tr in real epilepsy, the kids will sometimes fake a seizure to not go to school because they have a test. So you see that with epilepsy as well. <clears throat> so you need to work on the family. Family therapy is very critical. We work on discipline, parent training. There's good evidence to support the efficacy of those things once you have done the right medication to stabilize. And you do the crisis management the way I tell you. And that's the story. Any questions? Sir. What happens if they never get treatment, they never get diagnosed, do they go away? No. It does not go away by itself. This is not ADHD that often will dissipate with age because ADHD is, to, is basically a, a, a dopamine deficiency syndrome. 
So as dopamine builds up uh, with age, the syndrome becomes less obvious, so you're less different than others. And so as, as you become less different, you become more normal. By the time you're in uh, high school, you're showing very little of the ADHD. Very, most of it, you don't, probably don't even need the medicine, except for a small percentage that have chronic lifelong ADHD. Most people basically, uh, most of the time, tend to outgrow it. But that's not true of this. This is a completely different, this is a condition which I believe starts with a mild brain injury or brain dysfunction, genetic, or maybe a, this, you know, we get an awful lot of adopted children, and we don't know if there was you know, alcohol, if there was malnutrition, if there was, uh, it was abuse, so we don't, we don't know anything, they don't get a history. So we don't know what happened, but we know the kid's not functioning. So we get kids, we, have, we take a history, they have uh, difficult deliveries, they have, uh, they're premature with hypoxia, even though they give them oxygen, it doesn't necessarily completely eliminate the hypoxia. So <clears throat> they may have some mild brain, it's a mild brain problem. These kids have never been diagnosed by a neurologist as having a, a brain disease. Too mild for them to pick it up. If you know what a neurological exam is, they're not gonna pick it up. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. <clears throat> and even the test that they use sometimes, a regular EEG won't pick it up either. So they, they can go to a neurologist and they come back and say normal. Nothing wrong with the brain, psychiatric, Therapy, <laughs> but there is something. There is a, something wrong. If you know how to look for it, you know where to look, you will find mild brain problems in small but very important critical areas. The brakes, the amygdala, the, the rage button, those are critical areas. They're not, not very big, but they're critical. So <clears throat> you have to know which piece of brain is involved. These don't go away. They don't go away. They don't get better by themselves. They're not like ADHD, which is a dopamine deficiency that improves with age, so it's, it, it, it will continue and they will end up in jail, a lot of them. They end up hurting people and then they get into the, ju the justice system and, and, and you know, a lot of them end up in jail. They do not, they often get into drugs because they, they, they're trying to self-medicate. My kids don't use uh, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine. My kids like marijuana because it winds them down. <clears throat> so, um, they're gonna self-medicate with meds, not with drugs, not a good plan. They're gonna get involved with car accidents, they're gonna get involved with road rage, they're gonna get involved with all kinds of things because it is terrible condition. <coughs> it does not go away by itself. Any other questions? Uh, when they're stable, you said like after... When they're stable what? You said once they're stable. Once they're stable, once they're stable yeah. <clears throat> yes, okay. yes. In our experience, medications is very often very much like epilepsy. In epilepsy, about 50% of epileptics who are on medication will, with, will, after about a year, not need it anymore. And the other 50% need it the rest of their lives. And we're finding the same thing, very similar. About half of them can start, and what you do is you start looking for side effects. If they start getting side effects they never had before, with the same medicine, they don't probably need that medicine anymore. The body is now starting to reject it. Good, now you can start thinking about decreasing it because they may not need it <clears throat> after a while. It is possible, just like epilepsy, that once you have this medicine in you for about a year, that it, it, it has fixed it. And so you don't need the medication anymore. Now, if something happens biologically, um, some horrendous thing occurs, the thing can come back again, and I have had some occasions where a six-year-old, seven-year-old was fixed, and I see them again at 16 because something happened. They were in a car accident, and all of a sudden now the whole condition is back, and so it's sort of whatever it was stirred it up again, but that's pretty rare. Typically, you know, uh, if they're fixed, they're fixed, but if by the end of a year some of them start showing side effects to these same medicines that they were doing fine with, had no problem, then we start to ask them their docs and they're coming from all over the country, so we have to call the, talk to the docs from Alaska, from California, wherever they are, and say try to decrease the dose, maybe even get rid of it, because they probably don't need it anymore. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>